All right, welcome everyone. We're going to start the meeting here in just about a minute. Um, I just want to let everyone know that Don Johnson, in fact, has not found the Fountain of Youth, but uh, tonight in his stead is uh, Chief O'Donoghue, who also serves as the Assistant City Manager. So he'll be joining us here tonight. So anyone that wishes to approach this nice young man here for the Fountain of Youth, you're going to be disappointed to know it is not Don Johnson. And he's carrying. <laughs> All right, so we're at 7.29. Don't want it in the meeting minutes that I started the meeting early. Okay, 7.30. All right, I'm going to call to order the February 25th, 2019 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by Mayor Pro Tem Douglas, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you can. Last weekend, our city was the scene of three horrible incidents, <coughs> resulting in two deaths and injuries to two other people. We grieve with the families who lost a loved one. Our police officers and EMTs dealt with these tragedies promptly, professionally, and compassionately. Join me in thanking them for their service to our city and those who live and visit here. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our community indeed does have a wonderful public safety uh, reputation driven by the leadership of Chief O'Donohue and everyone that works in uniform. We also have a tremendous staff here in Royal Oak that help keep the city services running, boring things from, you know, what's the water system and sewer system doing under the ground, all the way to making sure our streets are plowed. Um, but the other thing that keeps our community moving is the tremendous effort of our volunteers, people that time in and time out we can always count on to serve the city, to help us navigate opportunities, to help us address issues, and our next agenda item here tonight is to take a moment to honor some of our long-term volunteers that have served on various committees throughout the city of Royal Oak uh, for a period of time. I've had the privilege and honor of knowing some of them and serving with them, and I can tell you this city is um, remarkably blessed to have uh, the folks that we're here to honor um, work on their own behalf on their own time for no compensation for the betterment of our community. So I'm gonna ask Mayor Pro Tem Douglas to join me uh, up at the um, microphone they specifically placed there for me uh, because I tend to wander. Um, and we're going to honor <laughs> show some appreciation. Um, just a quick check. Um, is Marianne Carmichael, Stanley Sherman, Marshall Thompson, or Al Tumala here tonight? Okay, they couldn't make it. Um, they'll be receiving their certificates um, via mail. But we do have a few. I could help you with that. Yeah, why, why don't we do that? That'll be a good help. All right. All right. John Diagnillo, come on up, sir. John volunteered for 12 years on the City of Royal Oaks Rehabilitation Board of Appeals. For those of you who don't know, this is a pretty important board in town. John? How are you? This board helps. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. For you. This board helps make tough decisions what to do with funds to make sure that we can invest in our community from senior services all the way through um, park improvements, many things you th see throughout the city. They're truly an advocate for the community. They have a pulse on what people want. They go through the arduous process and have to make the tough decisions to make recommendations to this body. We're so grateful for your 12 years of service, John. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's my Thanks pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Hi, John. Hi, Patricia. How are you? Good job. Mr. Ryan, I saw you here. Mr. Mark Ryan, 
He volunteered 21 years on the City of Royal Oaks Parks and Recreation and Senior Service Advisory Board. 21 years. He was four when he started. <laughs> and, you know, we've had all of his wisdom and experience. I have had the privilege of serving with Mark, seeing him in action, seeing his decision-making process, his empathy and ambition and passion for listening to residents and making sure that we keep, maintain, and build one of the best recreation programs in all of the state. Mark, this is a true honor. Thank you. Thank you for all your service. Bob Muller. Now, Bob is my neighbor. <laughs> Bob volunteered 16 years on the City of Royal Oak Zoning Board of Appeals. Bob was instrumental in making key decisions that has helped poise Royal Oak to be the amazing community it is today. Bob has served also um, in an environmental and natural point of view. He brought the, um, I'm going to try to say it again, the Arboretum uh, to Royal Oak. Uh, he still does tours uh, for children and people of all ages out in our, um, at Tenhave Woods in uh, Cummingston Park. Bob is a true definition of what a community volunteer is, and Royal Oak would not be where it is today without Bob's service. Bob, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Truly mean that. Is there a Mr. Mike Rip Rip in Mike Ripinski? Is it Mike Ripinski? Ripinski? Yeah, something like that. Mr. Ripinski, how are you, sir? Wow, this, we may be here all night. Mr. Ripinski, this award is presented to you for volunteering three years on the City of Royal Oak Senior Advisory Board, volunteering four years on the City of Royal Oak Normandy Oaks Task Force, volunteering 11 years on the City of Royal Oak Civil Service Board, and volunteering 11 years on the City of Royal Oak Parks, Recreation, and Senior Services Advisory Board. Let's, uh, I mean, that's an amazing, amazing rap sheet, Mr. Ripinski. I also had the privilege of working side by side with Mr. Rapinski, and I got to tell you, this is a person that truly cares about his community. He is a steward for the community. Um, he is both a uh, all-star in volunteerism and in his uh, role as a advocate realtor for this city. Um, he's dealt with many contentious situations with dignity, with honor and with pride and he is somebody that we can all be happy that has served us and we look forward to whatever new adventures you have mr rapinski thank you very much for all your time And I did use the microphone. That was a first as well. Okay. All right. Once again, how about a round of applause for all the volunteers? Always humbled by people's willingness to serve their community in such a positive capacity. Amazing. So this brings us to item number five on tonight's agenda, which is public comment. Uh, before we start, um, I'll just kind of go over the ground rules here. The City Commission values and relies on the input of our fellow citizens to make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on any city-related issue, whether it's on the agenda or not. As there are no public hearings scheduled for tonight's meeting, this will be the only time for the public to address the City Commission. I ask that comments be directed to the commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. If you wish to speak tonight at public comment, please wait until recognized by me, the mayor. Um, come up to the podium. For the record, we ask that you state your name and address. Um, also be mindful that uh, the city commission wants to hear from anybody who wishes to speak tonight. So comments are limited to three minutes or less. And we have a timer here at the podium to help you keep track of your time. If you don't wish to speak tonight, no problem. Feel free to reach out to us at any time via email, telephone, or whatever your preference is. Um, please note that the City Commission won't respond directly to questions during public comment. However, we will be taking notes and we'll address those questions when the agenda topic is discussed or uh, uh, discuss it with the proper City Department um, to make sure the matter is uh, resolved if it's not on the agenda. And our, um, 
acting city manager tonight will be taking notes uh, and you know we'll uh, follow up on those um, those items as appropriate also just uh, I got some feedback from a couple meetings ago uh, there were some people that you know wanted to come up and speak at public comment um, they felt a little bit uh, intimidated that they might have a minority uh, viewpoint and so we ask that, um, and it's the rules of the, of the community, not of this uh, commission, that we keep applause and, and cheer um, you know, at a very, very minimum, if non-existent at all, because we want to make sure we hear from everybody in the community, and we don't want anyone feel intimidated uh, that, they, uh, that their, uh, their voice is not heard. So with that, who's first tonight? Uh, yes, sir, I saw this hand go up. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, my name is. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Patrick McGee. I'm at uh, 4524 Elmhurst Avenue. Um, I just wanted to take the time to uh, you guys take the time to come down here and be on city council. I'll come down and take time to talk to you guys. Um, I sent you guys an email today that referenced a previous email. Uh, it's, it should be in your inbox, uh, date, like right around five-ish or so if you want to look for it. Put some PDFs in there. Um, the main topic I want to uh, talk about and for you guys to get in the notes here so it's part of the meeting minutes is the condition of Normandy Oaks Park as is today. Um, it's kind of fallen on neglect and um, going through the park and taking pictures of what I've seen. Um, I feel that Robertson Brothers is kind of taking advantage of the situation that they have there, having no neighbors, and also having a whole bunch of land that they can do whatever they want with. Um, there's numerous pieces of debris all over the place that are just blowing around. And from some of the pictures you can see, it's apparent why their trash is just being left in piles, sometimes on the street, sometimes in their yards. Um, I bring this up because every other person that builds houses in Royal Oak or wants to build houses in Royal Oak is required to have a fence that you guys approved um, as a commission. Robinson Brothers did not have to do that per house. Makes sense. Um, the one thing I did want to bring up and talk about was the fact that the PUD as a whole needs to have a fence put around it or um, better control of the, the, the debris that the housing uh, development is taking is generating right for every house they put up there i don't know how much trash they're de generating but or just around the park on the 16th of february i walked around i captured over 50 pieces of garbage as well as multiple bags of garbage from the housing development and i don't have any way of communicating to robertson brothers saying hey you guys need to do a better job of protecting the environment and building houses responsibility so i'm going to ask you guys to be my voice to robertson brothers from the city saying hey you guys had a great deal on the land. You have all these houses you're building. How about you take care of the park next to you? Um, so my request to you guys is contact Robertson Brothers. Say, hey, are you guys using dumpsters? Are you protecting the local area? And uh, once, uh, side note that I wanted to bring up here, um, at the Parks and Rec meeting, they have taken a boulder, and I captured it in one of my emails to you guys. They took a boulder from the park and put it in their housing development. I don't know how they got away with that. So uh, in one of the emails, you guys want to pull it up, take a look at it. The boulder was in the park previously, and now it's on a housing, housing lot. And in fact, now it's in two pieces moving around the housing development. So that's it. Uh, quick note, just the fence and better control of the litter being generated by Robertson Brothers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGee. Who's next? Uh, Mr. Ashley. Good evening. My name is Alan Ashley. I live at Royal Oak Manor. Uh, on February 14th, around 1230 in the afternoon, I was coming from the parking lot between 6th and 7th, otherwise known as P7. And as I got close to the center, I looked down the corner of my and what did I find? A car coming straight at me, turning on, going south uh, from 6, turning uh, south on Main Street. Uh, I put out my arms to protect myself and I slid off the hood of the car and off to the side. As he was yelling, are you all right? He backed up, took off down, so down Main Street south. I tried to get his license plate number, but it was covered with snow. I went the next day to file a police report. They say because you couldn't describe a good description of the car or the license pump, there's really nothing we can do. 
I have sat in front of traffic committee, DDA in here, pleading for pedestrian lights at 6th and 7th, and all I get is deer in the headlight looks. I am sick and tired of this. I, now this is personal. This is becoming dangerous area. In three years, you're going to have OCC redevelop 7th to Lincoln with the Culinary Arts School and the arts program. You're going to have Birds and Cats been putting up a building. You're going to have across from the fire department on 6th Street, 74 apartments, plus a Jewish community center. This is going to be a congested area, and we need pedestrian lights, not like the ones you had on 11 Mile. Those are only good for letting people know cars are coming out of one of the million parking garages you have around here. This is ridiculous. I talked to the city engineer. He says it's too expensive and all that. How is it too expensive when a city like Clawson, half the size of Royal Oak in every way, can put up two on 14 Mile Road to protect their citizens? They are busy with semis night and day 24 7 and i know this because i used to live on 14 mile in the condominiums right next to guardian angels church there are trucks going across there because it's an entrance and exit to i-75 to coolidge to all over they can put up two and we can't put up one one to protect the citizens of royal oak this is ridiculous you're going to put in slow down lanes they're only going to slow down traffic twice a day, Monday through Friday, during rush hour. If you don't believe me, go up Main Street after rush hour, 40 miles an hour, all the way up the Main to Clawson. You can do that almost all the way to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We need pedestrian lights like Royal Oak ads in the middle of the street overhanging both sides of the road at 6th Street and just beyond 7th Street to protest the pastorians. This is ridiculous. And this is time this city take care of its citizens, young and old, like you're supposed to. Chief O'Donoghue. Uh, just Mr. Ashley, before you sit down, just I just need to clarify. When you came to the station, they took a report? They said they couldn't file a report because I didn't have enough. They, oh, they said they couldn't file a report. Because I okay. didn't have a license number or a good description okay. of the truck. Okay, or, that's that's improper. If that happened, that shouldn't have happened. But, but I, Did they you were follow up with Sergeant Tycow? We, no, I did not. I was okay. told there was nothing the police. Uh, it was the, the desk desk sergeant. person told you that, right? They, uh, that was February 15th. Okay. We'll or look sometime into that. in All the right, morning. We'll take a report and we'll look into it. I mean, ideally. Reports taken immediately after the incident. Well, I was a little. Most valuable. I yep. was a little, I and I didn't think any. I could do anything because of I couldn't give the description of the truck. I know it was white with a little bit of red striping on it, and that was it. Couldn't get the license number, so it was really. I figured you couldn't do anything, but I, the next overthinking night, I said, okay. I'll file a report. Well, we definitely need a report on that, and so if, it, I, if they, I I went down the next day. Okay, well, we'll look into that. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. All right. Mr. Lolito, I see. Good evening, Mayor and City Commission. Uh, Gary Lolito, 4226 South Verona Circle, Royal Oak. Proud resident of Royal Oak since 1992, and I'm honored to have served on the City Commission from 2005 to 2009. Um, so I want to thank each of you guys for serving because I know it's not a not always a, a job that everybody appreciates, but I do. So I'm coming to here tonight to celebrate our wonderful city and to kind of give my 10-year check-in. Um, since I left the commission in 2009, what have I been doing? Um, a lot of exercising. I'm now an official Ironman as of last year. All right. Um, me and my uh, spouse started a Saturday morning running group, um, and we um, it really started with me being the water boy. Um, slowly turned into a runner and now a triathlete. Um, if anybody's interested in with running, running with us, uh, we have the VCRs, which is a Verona Circle of Runners. We now have 120 people strong, and so anybody that's willing to uh, come out on a Saturday morning at 8 a.m. to join us, feel free to join us at our house. We actually start from that location. Um, so while I've been busy and I haven't been asleep of what's going on in the city, um, I am very happy that you guys put in the new bike lanes, so thank you for that. Um, as an avid biker now, 
um, just finished two and a half hours on the bike this this evening. It's great to see that we are not the first at the game, but we actually are now part of the game. Um, I want to congratulate on all the new development that's happened since I've left. Um, new office building on second. We now have a hotel where people can stay when they're out of town. My guests that come in from out of town. We have a 696 where I used to live, a project that's taken over 30 years is finally going to be finished, so congratulations on that, because that never happened while I was on there. We had several developments, but it never happened. Uh, redevelopment of the 13 and Woodward is starting to look great. I'm excited about that, because I live down at that end now. Uh, the Normandy Oaks development, uh, I think is looking good or actually we actually sometimes run past there so it's starting to look good I'm sure it'll be even better once the park is done um, I am excited about the old billings which I saw the rendering on that and that looks good so thank you for that um, and also the city redevelopment and the addition of a, a downtown park I think is exciting um, little things that I've read to on the farmers market first of all it's going nowhere I'm not sure why people think the city is trying to get rid of it. It doesn't make sense to me. As serving on the uh, Farmers Market Committee at the time, um, there were rumors all the time that that was going away. I don't know where they're getting that information. But um, we upgraded the kitchen while I was right before I left, and it opened, I think, right after I left. Um, so the market, I think, think, has improved, and I think it continues to improve, and I think it's a destination for the city. I do also like all the new signage in our parks and in our downtown. I think the gr whoever created the design, I think they did a great job. And hey, I got to hey, wrap Gary, up here. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I, <laughs> I thought it was going to take less than three minutes. I, <laughs> Marie's like, you got three minutes. I'm like, okay. But anyways, thank you um, again. That's my 10-year report. I really do appreciate it. I had more, but I'll let it, it go from there. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Lolito. Yep. Former Commissioner Gary Lolito. Yes, sir, Mr. McPherson. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Eric McPherson. I'm with the uh, Sheet Metal Workers, Organized Labor. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, 211 uh, building trade members who live in uh, Royal Oak. On top of that, we have uh, four, 1,900 households of the AFL that live in Royal Oak. But I just want to commend the commissioners uh, about the projects you're doing in uh, Royal Oak on the corner here, 11 to Maine. Um, that's going to bring $250 million in economic growth to Royal Oak. Um, you guys have excellent schools, private schools. You have local community college. It will continue to grow and thrive. Um, parking. You're going to have plenty of parking once all this stuff gets going. Uh, more community events will be held in this cutting-edge cutting, cutting edge downtown area that you guys are developing. The creation of many high-paying, livable wage jobs are going to be created where uh, people can continue living in this community. And with all this, housing values will increase in the city of Royal Oak. Um, as organized labor, you, you're provide, they provide excellent health care, retirement benefits, along with livable, livable wages and job security, and uh, which have been made possible for our members to continue living in Royal Oak where they grew up and they can continue living here in reti retirement. The city has excellent medical facilities, educational, legal resources. Uh, the activity that con contributes to the greatness of the city and reminding the citizens that investing the, the time of a well-built city projects built on time with quality craftsmanship, organized labor. You guys will have long-lasting facilities for a better uh, community atmosphere overall. And Royal Oak has the golden standard of Main Street that other cities in Oakland County thrive to be and aspire to become. So let's keep it that way. Ho hopefully you guys will continue with these projects and uh, get them awarded with organized labor. Uh, they are a part of this community. And I'll thank you, Eric McPherson. Yep. Thank you, Mr. McPherson. about clapping we may have some opposing views commissioner Donig or I'm sorry Marie Donigan former commissioner Marie Donigan and former state rep Marie Donigan I'm now known as the church ladies so. <laughs> <laughs> 
So my name is Marie Donegan, 5,000, 5,003, 503, 503 Poplar. I can't even say my own address. So former city commissioner, former state rep. So this weekend, I was moved to read minutes from 1997 to 2017 to remember where we've been in this city. Um, this is my three minute, I hope, synopsis. Um, by the way, I served until 2005. The 14 city commissioners and three mayors I served with wanted to turn city owned parking lots into developments to generate revenue, increase our tax base, add density and diversify downtown and increase parking. In the early 2000s, we issued RFPs. Some had parameters, some were broad, some were unsolicited. We chose preferred developers and had joint meetings with the DDA, but we just could never pull the trigger. In 2006, those commissioners issued an RFP for the Frizzard lot and discuss had discussions about a new hotel. They identified city assets for redevelopment for Class A office. They wanted to form partnerships to increase density downtown and a new, get a new center city park, a uh, new center street parking deck, city hall, police station, and a central park. They wanted to eliminate the we have tried that before and we can't do that mentality. The recession then hit, development deals were scarce, but these goals stayed on the table. Then in 2013, this commission broke ground on the Etkin office in a city-owned parking lot, sold revenue bonds for a new parking deck, and created the downtown task force to address the issues we'd been talking about for all these years. In May of 2014, to no one's surprise, the task force identified the development of city-owned parking lots to fulfill our collective and long-held goals. Our new economic development director contacted high-profile developers. Multiple responses were received, and the city center project is the result. In 2017, I agreed to serve a one-year term on the city commission. I brought with me a well-earned skepticism about this project. At a 2004 City Commission meeting, I declared, after one of our many development deals fell through, that I was not fond of complicated development agreements. I said, and I quote myself, I've been on the City Commission for five years, and in that time, we haven't succeeded at one. So the City Center project, this one, is a more aggressive and far huger than anything I'd ever imagined. But I was relieved that they, that you had brought in Plant Moran Cressa and Brandy Mathis of Kerr Russell and Weber to represent the city because they are second to none. So is this project or something like it what commissioners tried to get all those years? I don't know. But I was in the room when projects didn't get off the ground and when one finally did. So in meeting after meeting in excruciating detail, we challenged our development team until I thought I'd scream. But in the end, we have a unique project that will welcome 1,500 new workers to spend money in our shops and eat our food, and we'll finally get a new city hall and police station 23 years later. So Royal Oak is a thriving community. Families are moving here. The city is delivering the things that citizens requested. We have a AAA or AA plus bond rating. Royal Oak is my hometown, and I was talking to my best friend, Kathy, who moved away in 1965. She hasn't been back here in 40 years, but still calls Royal Royal Oak, her hometown. And I know that if she came back today, she would see the place that she remembers. We'd walk around downtown like our nine-year-old selves, go to the library, but this time we'd be able to go to happy hour. Thank you, Ms. Donegan. <laughs> Mr. Harrison. Recaps. Uh, Bill Harrison, 2729 uh, Trafford. A uh, proud resident of Royal Oak since 1941. Uh, with the recent uh, action downtown, uh, I got to be thinking, we need to have a disincentive for the bars kicking brawlers out instead of calling the police. And we know why they do this. They do this so that when they come up before the board to uh, get their license renewed, they're always... Uh, uh, presented with how many police calls they've had during the course of the year. <coughs> Trouble only escalates when these people are kicked out. We now have two recent incidents. The first involved a firearm, and this second one just over the weekend involved a vehicle running down people. So what I'm proposing is that you get one done for uh, having a police call, you get five for kicking somebody out of your bar and they have a problem outside the bar. Uh, I, I found it interesting, you know, recently we're hearing a lot from uh, 
Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, often referred to as AOC, of the New York Socialist chapter. Uh, she's celebrating the uh, Amazon deal uh, being canceled. She thought New York was doing what Royal Oak did, giving the developer money up front uh, as opposed to a uh, tax uh, abatement. You guys need to get your stories together between the New York chapter and the Royal Oak chapter. Um, I have a uh, question. Uh, when Boji changed the development from office to medical, that was a major change. Uh, it was a major change in the number of people that would be employed there. It was a major change in terms of the utilization of the parking deck. I mean, if this is going to be a 24-hour operation, there goes your shared parking uh, concept. And again, less, uh, 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 less people. Uh, I guess my concern is, you know, I've been in real estate for almost 35 years, and if somebody would have done that to me, changed the paradigm of, uh, of the deal, I would have dragged them back in for a renegotiation of the contract. I don't think that was done. And uh, I'm particularly concerned that when he's filled his obligation to pay back the, quote, $5.2 million over, what, 12 years or whatever, then uh, there's nothing to preclude him from selling the building to the medical facility, and now you've lost your tax base. You should have dragged this guy back in, said we're going to renegotiate the deal, and we're going to prohibit you from selling your building to a non uh taxable uh, entity and you got attorneys on the, the board that will recognize that you can put anything in the contract over a hundred thousand dollars that both parties agree to thank you thank you mr thank harrison you. mr wolf uh i see a hand right here yes sir good evening joshua bernazzo from 221 normandy road um, I'm here today to just give you a little backstory about my family. I li moved here about five years ago with just my wife. We enjoyed everything Royal Oak has to offer, nightlife, festivals, all that stuff. Um, two and a half years ago, we had our daughter, which was now she's two and a half, obviously. Um, we've enjoyed the parks that you guys have put up. All the new toys have come this last spring, fall. Things are great. The library is awesome. Um, what affords me to live in this wonderful city that you guys have created is actually working for local lady, the union sheet metal workers all. They give us great benefits, great wage, and if it wasn't for being able employed by them and being able to have the hours that they bring to us for our contractors, I don't think I'd be able to live in this wonderful city. So I just want to say thank you guys for choosing union workers. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Appreciate it. Mr. Wolf. Thank you. Uh, Ron Wolf, 33 North Troy. Uh, of course, I want to congratulate Spike Lee from my fellow Brooklyn Knight. And uh, also, I want to know that, notice that we have an ethnic celebration thing. And, uh, you know, a long time ago, I was dragged in unknowingly into the civil rights movement when I gave a young black, helped get a, give a young black man a job in New Rochelle, New York in 1962 and was called an end lover and all that stuff. But uh, I, I've been, I also have been active in West Bloomfield and, uh, and uh, uh, convinced uh, someone there to look into hiring more, uh, at least one black officer. And, and uh, we've had one black officer for how many years now? Uh, you know, and, uh, he went to Dundero, so he wasn't exactly recruited from somewhere else. I think maybe it's about time you look somewhere else. All around you, uh, all around in America now, we're talking diversity, diversity, and we talk about how we're a, uh, a welcoming community, uh, sanctuary community, and yet we're still mostly uh, a white community. So I'm not asking that we're suddenly going to integrate overnight, but you know the history of Michigan. So please, let's, uh, Chief, let's, let's look into that, would you please? Now, the other thing, uh, I, I happen to notice, you know, when Boji, uh, when, when Boji built that, when had that parking structure built, how much is that? Was that 16 million or 18 million for that? 
about a 16, 18 million. Right next to it is a library. I think if somebody, a realtor, was to give an appraisal, it would probably come not even two million. And uh, I, I, I think it's about time that library got expanded and built out. I mean, where are the priorities? That, that parking structure is the Taj Mahal of parking structures. I think if someone from out of town were to come to Royal Oak, they'd have trouble recognizing it as a parking structure. If you go to some of the fanciest neighborhoods, and when you see parking structures, I mean, Gross Point, for instance, they're gray cement. I mean, and everyone knows it's a parking structure. You go by this thing, you think it's a hotel. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't understand where the priorities are. The park. Uh, this is where I, I've been crying that we should look into a, a nice park and, uh, and, and get a fountain and make this a, a mini campus marshes, so to speak. Uh, the ice rink idea, I don't know. That it's only for a few months. I think the fountain is another fountain and, and also making it as big as possible. And we only have two little butterflies outside there in front of the library. That wasn't the city's doing. That was a, a, a citizen. Who, who did that, and, and yet I, I've seen adults on that, those things having fun, <laughs> you know. We, we need a play area downtown. We need a nice park downtown. We don't, it's, it's not neighborhood versus downtown park. The downtown is a neighborhood, and as far as marijuana, please, I know I'm getting down here, and I know I'm at the end, but uh, you're, this is a Trojan horse. By prohibiting marijuana, it, it, it has a sunset clause. It's a Trojan horse. Bochy's going to bring in the marijuana. You all know that. We all know that. And this farce of a, uh, 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 of a discussion, we know where it's headed. Let's like all discussions. It's just a preamble to bring Wolf, in the Trojan horse. Wolf, I do need you to finish horse. your last thought, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Uh, yes, sir, here in the audience. Good evening, Council. My name is Tom McWilliams. I reside at 3030 Maplewood, Royal Oak. I'm a second uh, generation union plumber. Uh, there's been a plumber at that address paying uh, taxes for $61 that benefited my myself, my mom and dad when they raised us four kids there. Uh, I wanted to thank you for using some responsible contracting, using skilled labor, and also to mention that I've got eight of my colleagues here uh, from the Plumbers Local, one of them which is our business agent, Larry Delahant. I asked our uh, director of the school where we have a four and a half million dollar facility where we uh, teach all the safety and the training of our trade. We don't push that on anybody else. And I hope that you recognize that. And I just wanted to say thank you and uh, Hopefully you continue to support skilled labor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Hi, um, I'm Cheryl Fike, 1114 East 3rd Street, Royal Oak. Um, I am also skilled trades. Electricians are here to represent too. We appreciate you using union labor. If you want it done, you want it done right, and you want it on, on time, you will go with the union. Uh, we saw that when all these lofts were going up, they were almost all union. And the one that failed at the corner of, Nor uh, I'm nervous, 11 in Maine, on the northwest corner is the one that went non-union and the one that failed. There was a problem with the decks there. So anyways, I just want to say 20 years in Royal Oak, I raised my son here, union wages, union living, it's the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fike. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just a quick reminder about the clapping. We, uh, every meeting, I know, very passionate speeches tonight. Uh, yes, sir. My name is John Daniello, and I live at 627 Lloyd Avenue for 35 years. Uh, thank you for my certificate of thanks for my service on the Rehabilitation Board of Appeals. 
which is comprised of uh, volunteer citizen members empowered to grant or deny appeals for the eligibility requirements of the Housing Assistance Program. I'd like to recognize and commend the work of Deborah Murray, Housing Rehabilitation Officer. Uh, she helps people get uh, low interest loans to fix up their houses around town. And also there's a grant program that more people should take advantage of. Also like to recognize uh, Commissioner Pat Peruk for her service on the committee and, and Kyle DeBach before that. Thanks a lot for uh, helping us out over the years. Uh, I was, uh, uh, there was one older fellow on the, on, the, on the committee that's still there, I believe his name is Carl Stone, and, and I'm glad that he's still there with us. We have a new generation coming up. Uh, the City's Rehabilitation Board of Appeals has been advising the City Commission on annual request for community development block, block grant funds. And in that regard, I'd like to recognize and commend the work of Joseph Murphy, uh, Director of Planning. Uh, the primary objective of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 is the development of viable urban communities. Viable communities are achieved by providing the following principally for the persons of low and moderate income, decent housing, suitable living environment, and expanded economic opportunities. Before 2005, uh, the requests for CDBG funding were handled by the Citizens Advisory Committee. I was also on that committee. I became a member of that committee in 2003 at the behest of then Mayor Bill Urich and with the recommendation by Commissioner Carlo Ginotti. Um, so I've been volunteering for a lot longer than just 12 years. Uh, in those years, I learned a lot uh, from working with then commissioners Mike Andrejack, Marie Donegan, and Steve Miller. But mostly, I learned about how to be an interested citizen of Royal Oak through the many discussions I had with fellow members of the Citizens Advisory Committee. We used to meet over at the Senior Center. And I'd like to recognize and commend these fellows in particular for their remarkable contributions on that board in the early years of my tenure. Pete Mancour uh, was a fellow that uh, used to go out and do the legwork. He'd, he'd check out the houses, he'd check out the buildings, he knew a lot about construction. Very interested citizen. Also, there was a guy named Bill Willard, who for years was on, on both of our committees. And he, uh, hopefully, he's happy that Sherman Drive has finally been paved, because we talked about that for many years. Uh, Bill Shaw was kind of a pain in the ass. But uh, he was, uh, he, we, because of him, we had a lot of long discussions, and I learned a lot about the city. So thank goodness for guys like that. And uh, I hope that more people like that will be coming up in the future. Uh, also, back then, I did have, I did learn a lot from Marty Sterling, who's now with another city. She was a deputy planning there, and also Richard Bremer and uh, Kathy McNulty, who was a secretary back then. Some highlights over the years have been the improvements to 4th Street, 11 Mile Road. Uh, we did a lot to help the Senior Center for a long time. We helped the Royal Oak Playhouse Theater. We helped the Women's Club get an elevator. We funded improvements for the Orson Star House and the Main Street uh, and also the Historic Museum, which is the old firehouse on Webster. We funded paving for many residential streets and sidewalks, and we raised dilapidated Waterworks Building and Waterworks Park. Anyways, now I'm on another committee. I'm on the, uh, the uh, Commission for the Arts, and I started doing that in 2017. And uh, anyways, you're probably going to be hearing about a program that I'd like to put on at the Royal Oak Library. It's going to be called the Royal Oak Public Library Writers and Music Series. And I hope that you'll fund it when you hear about it. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a Tuesday night series once a month, presenting artists, poets, and songwriters at the Royal Oak Library in the Friends Auditorium. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. We look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Kurt Hess. I live at 3607 Normandy. Grew up at 4009 Elmhurst. My father lived in Royal Oak since 1933. He just passed away a couple weeks ago. Um, my family owns a union construction company. We're signatory with most of the union trades. Um, I'd like to thank you all for supporting union labor throughout the years. I remember being on the project over at the manor. This gentleman was talking about almost getting hit by a car. He lives in the manor building. We were there. That was one of the first one of the first precast buildings to go up in the area. Went up a floor a day. I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, at the time, you supported union labor. It uh, went off without a hitch. It's a wonderful building. It's still standing today, and I believe our roof is still on it. Um, 
Uh, seeing all the support here for union labor makes me feel uh, thrilled. I have a great working relationship with Local 80, Eric McPherson, and Local 149, the Roofers Local. We were also a big part of the Oakland Community College campus when that went up in 1982. We did all the roofing on that, and I thank you for that, and I'd like to uh, ask you to continue to support organized labor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hess. All right. I think, Mr. Rapinski, you had the quick draw this time. Mike Rapinski, 3152 Parker, Royal Oak. Um, be, I had some comments I wanted to make, but I just want to take a quick minute and acknowledge all the uh, skilled trades and the union workers in the audience tonight. It, it's meaningful to me. My father was um, a union auto worker down in Toledo where I grew up. My older brother was uh, with the Communication Workers of America. I have a nephew that's an iron worker. I have very many friends that are iron workers and carpenters. and. Um, I am happy that our city continues to support organized labor in the various projects that we do. And I acknowledge all those folks that are here tonight. Thank you. Um, I am humbled and thankful to uh, receive the certificate of appreciation for my volunteer activities. It has been an honor to serve my adopted hometown of Royal Oak. Uh, we've, wife and I have lived here for over 40 years. Uh, We've, I've served on these various boards and committees, and, but due to my recent uh, health issues, I've elected to step away from these positions while I concentrate on my well-being for now. However, I do want to encourage my fellow citizens of Royal Oak to look into participating with these many boards and committees. From, from what I see on social media and public comment, I know there are many passionate Royal Oak residents and suggest to them to direct your passion to making a difference in a positive way. Check on the city's website for the many opportunities and fill out an application to apply for one of these committees. And you don't have to start out on the Planning Commission or the ZBA. Look at the Civil Service Board, the Library Board, or even Parks and Rec. Those are good places to start. And don't give up if you're not selected right away. Uh, it, sometimes it'll take you a couple of chances. I think it, I applied like four times before I got on the Civil Service Board, which, by the way, is probably the easiest one to serve on. So. Um, Having said that, I also want to take a, a few minutes to say a few words about some recent comments uh, regarding the current contract and development with the parking garage and, and the city center project. I'm annoyed and disappointed that some people have recently made misleading statements and false accusations and have acted in, the, uh, excuse me, have made false accusations. The current and past administration and commissions have been totally transparent in all our negotiations and development contracts and have acted in the best interest of the city. If anything, they should be applauded for their dedication, leadership, and integrity. I caution my fellow residents, do not be fooled by a few naysayers with a personal agenda. They put their own interests above those of the city as a whole and are trying to impede progress of these developments with worthless legal actions, which have been dismissed by two jurisdictions so far. And they're, all they're doing is uh, trying to delay and disrupt to further their own agenda. And for the record, I don't agree with everything that's going on with the city center project. I think some of the timing on these projects could have been better planned. I think uh, uh, there are some concerns with parking, so I'm not just towing the line. But I do support the vision and the leadership of the majority of this commission and this body to move our city forward and to continue the progress toward a more vibrant, safe, livable, and desirable community. To all of you, I say, stay the course and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapinski. Ladies and gentlemen, name is Timothy Housley, 2440 Brockton Avenue. And um, this is the third time over the last couple of years I've spoke on behalf of the uh, development project. Um, the first time um, I did come to um, encourage and promote organized labor. I'm a organized, uh, I'm a union skilled tradesman myself. Um, and um, for reasons already mentioned, like the uh, northwestern corner, you know, that's just one fine example. Um, I uh, herniated a disc in my back a little over a year and a half ago, worked 17 days last year. Um, 
my benefit package is so good that I still have um, an excellent PPO through August of this year, having not worked at all, like about 17 days last year. Um, I'm at, I don't know if I'm going to return to my trade because um, I'm pretty messed up. So now as I'm kind of looking as an alternative income, I'm really realizing um, what I'm going to be missing out on should that occur, should I not return to my trade. Um, organized labor not only, um, in my opinion, um, takes um, excellent care of the, uh, the working man. Um, by comparison, wages and benefits really kind of pale um, from what I'm seeing. And, um, and as far as the craftsmanship and the standard, um, hopefully what's been accomplished thus far has been satisfactory. I expect it probably has been. And um, so as far as the resources and whatnot go and those standards, uh, I expect that you'll continue to be pleased. Thanks for hearing me again. Thank you, Mr. House. Gray sweater. Is that Ms. Wagman? Come on up. Come on up. I'm like the Mayor Rod Roddy. And don't say a quick thank you to Commissioner May. Do this every time. Commissioner Macy and uh, Judy Davids for starting the uh, campaign for the lock boxes. And I hear the file for life is coming also for seniors. So thank you very much. Okay. Royal, Royal Manor Senior High Rise has a huge parking problem. At the last meeting, you authorized parking for six non-guaranteed parking spots on the street for six residents with mobili mobility issues. The lack of parking, difficulty, and danger walking to the parking lot across the street, the usurping of spaces for special downtown events, the eventual sale of that lot, and an 80% increase in the cost of parking permits for these seniors on limited incomes were not addressed. Why does this have to be done piecemeal and temporary? The city shares culpability in creating this issue. Take, taking liberty from Governor Whitmer, please fix the damn senior safety and parking problem. Speaking of senior parking, a welcoming city whose commission's vision statement contains the word diverse, word diverse would consider all demographics when designing the Civic Center in downtown areas. For instance, handicapped parking spaces should have been painted and proper legal signage installed before the existing spaces were removed from the farmer's market. Handicapped street parking should be a part of the plan like Birmingham is implementing. To my knowledge, there's zero handicapped parking in Royal Oak in downtown Royal Oak. Also, should Royal Oak follow ADA minimum requirements or realize certain venues attract a higher percentage of seniors and plan accordingly? Should Royal Oak do what is minimally required or what is right? The, mes the message is clear. Unless you are capable of walking in our walkable city, you are not welcome in the downtown. Please fix the damn senior parking problem. I again urge the City Commission to reestablish the Senior Advisory Committee. The Senior Task Force has acknowledged that they are a multi-year endeavor focused on gathering data and developing a plan, not addressing individual items such as parking now. Merging seniors onto a board with Parks and Rec where we finally, thanks to Commissioner Macy, have one or two items per month is a token gesture. Also, I feel compelled to remind certain members of this Commission they are not here to grandstand while accusing other commissioners of grandstanding. Your job is to state your reasons for supporting or not supporting an issue and vote accordingly. Your comments about the public com commenters has no place here. You're changing the facts they present to coincide with your political spin, especially when they cannot respond, has no place here. And the chair's job is to recognize commissioners who wish to speak not selectively attempt to silence them. Your partisan politics have no place at these proceedings. And I'll be leaving right after public comment because I can go home and watch it. Uh, there's been a couple comments about uh, people leaving after public comment. We can watch it there unless you want to add a public comment time afterwards, like they do at the, the um, Board of Education meetings. Uh, there's no reason for us to stay. Thank you, so. Ms. Wagman. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. 
Thank you. I see a hand in the back, Mr. Wolf. Is that Mr. Colo? Come on up, sir. Hi, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the commission. I'm Brandon Colo of 600 East Hudson Avenue. Um, I'm here tonight to present uh, the annual report from the library. I didn't realize I've had such a crowd for it. So, um, so, but before I start that, I need to, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Friends book sale that is May 7th through 10th this year. That's a Thursday through Sunday. I always love the fact that it happens on a Sunday because we're finally open on Sundays. Um, so please come down. The Friends provide about $40,000 a year in funding for the library. That's um, every children's program, every adult concert, anything you do that's fun is uh, thanks to the Friends. Mr. So Carly, big th Mr. Carly, you meant March 10th, March, March 7th through 10th? Yes, yes, thank you, Commissioner Mesa. It's March 7th through 10th. I'm not advertising that really. So March 7th through 10th, a couple weeks away. Um, so with that being said, uh, according to the charter, we need to present our annual report to you on a yearly basis. 17 through 18 was a very exciting year for the library. Um, we started to explore new collections, such as the C Library. C Library is a fun uh, collection that allows residents to take home seats. Uh, they've been created from different co uh, organizations, donations. Um, we have a really cool bin of them. Come take as many seats as you want, plant them, and see what you can come up with. Uh, personally, I need someone to come like midsummer and tend to the crop for me as I'm usually losing all my good harvest at that point, but um, the, the seeds are a lot of fun. Also launched this year was a new uh, delivery service for, um, for homebound residents. Um, I would really encourage everyone here, if you know of anyone who is homebound, can't get out, can't access the library for any reason, we will send them books. That's free of charge. We'll help curate books for them if they don't know what they want to read. All you have to do is call and talk to the reference desk. We'll send them to you. They'll be delivered in the mail. All you have to do is put them in the prepaid pouch that uh, we send with them and have your uh, postal carrier pick them up. Um, it's a great, um, great new addition to a library. And uh, I would once again encourage everyone here to let people know about it. Um, administratively, a lot of work went into keeping the Royal Oak Public Library relevant and moving forward this year. And that is reflected in some of the numbers you see in this report. Um, programming attendance increased over 8% over the previous year. Um, our staff was hard at work, and it's really no surprise to me that the program went up. I'm sure it's not to you either, as I've seen almost all of you at the library program over the last year. Um, our staff has worked tirelessly in developing new services and promoting existing ones, and their work has paid off. So a huge thank you to all the staff, full-time, part-time, and volunteers over at the Royal Oak Public Library. Um, so the library boards keenly aware of the need to provide for those who provide for us. Um, so as I said, our staff has done an amazing job, and we want to recognize that. Um, in our current financial year, we've instituted an increase in the step raise for our staff. Um, while there may be some out there that don't agree that paying people well is the best use for our money, we know that study after study shows that retaining staff that's happy will give us better services to the public. So um, we're really excited to this year offer and make sure that we're paying our staff what they deserve to be paid. Um, so likewise, soon we'll be seeing some facility improvements over at the library. Um, and following the lead set forth by this commission, we're seeking RFPs that include prevailing wages. Um, we want to make sure, <clears throat> sorry, as we want to make sure that our staff's being paid well, we want to take care of those who are providing for us. When you're having a building built, when we're, incre we're doing new panels at the library, we want to make sure that we're improving services not on the backs of those laboring for us. So by going with a prevailing wage job, that means that the person working on our building is reaping the benefits of their labor, being paid a fair rate, and receiving benefits. So I'd like to thank this commission in particular for setting forth that example. After Michigan struck down the law, you've set forth that example that as a community, we go forward, forward with prevailing wage. So finally, on a bittersweet note, um, this is the last week of our library director, Mary. She's uh, retiring at the end of this week, moving on. Um, you know, Mr. Mayor, I vaguely remember you giving her a hug last time we were here together. You barely have even given me a week and nod in the past, so, you know, maybe, maybe once. Um, but I'd like to extend an invitation here for everyone. We're having a 
Once again, the friends are hosting a retirement party for her. That's Grand Thursday. It's from four to seven at the library. I encourage the entire community to come out. It's a celebration of Mary, all that she's done. There's gonna be refreshments and food. Um, and on top of that, you also get a chance to meet our new library director. Um, we conducted a six month search that seemed never ending at times. And we found someone in our backyard the entire time. Uh, we've promoted the head of youth services to the new director of public, uh, the Royal Oak Public Library, um, Emily Damas. She's a Royal Oak resident a young mother to a very active little girl, and uh, she's now a new director. So I'm really looking forward to what Emily can uh, do for us, and uh, I want to say goodbye to Mary. So please come out and see us this week. Thank you, Mr. Cullo. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I'll be there, and I'll have lots of hugs for Mary. And if there's anything <laughs> left over, I may pat you on the shoulder. You know, it'd be for sure. <laughs> Better than the kick summer uh, Commissioner Buck will give me, so. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Colo. Yes, sir. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Dante Valente of 312 West Bloomfield. I'm just here, I'm a part of the Sheet Metal Workers Local 80 Union. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for always uh, going union before and just wanna put it out there to keep going with us. Uh, I've only been with them for about a year now, but. It really is just different here. The way we do work, the way we care about what kind of product goes out and what really what, you know, the final product is. It's just, it's, uh, it's miraculous. Um, I've been living here my whole life. Uh, when I talk about this uh, city with people I meet, I talk about it with high praise. And everybody also knows that this is a great city. They come here for the nightlife. And uh, I'd like to also one day hope to live here. Uh, that's all I really got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Don. Von Eberstein. Kirk Von Eberstein, 3105 Clawson Avenue. I'm here to, well, back up with everything Marie Donnegan said, you know, about the city. Uh, I was here for the town house, open house for the Boji Surnow uh, development, and I gave my wholehearted approval to it. Um, I was born here in 1952, so, you know, I grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It was rather boring, rather staid, nothing going on, uh, day life or night life. And uh, I'm also now part of the Royal Oak Schools Foundation, also known as the Royal Oak Foundation for Public Education. Local 80, sheet metal workers, they come to our golf outing every year. Yeah, It's in June, last Monday in June, folks. So it's a great fundraiser for us. And Pat Perusha, actually she told me she in, helped incorporate the Royal Foundation for Public Education. In a past life. In a past life, 1992, 1993. So I want to thank her and the many people that signed the incorporation papers. Uh, they elected me treasurer, God knows why. But uh, I've got work to do. And... Um, I thank you for this great city that we live in and uh, try to keep our taxes lower. Uh, and that's all I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kurt. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, I'm Stephen Truscott, 3630 Dukeshire Highway. I have a small thing that sometimes those small things can turn out to be big things. There is a uh, uh, crosswalk across 13 Mile at the intersection of 13 and Hillside. That's the staff entrance to Beaumont. Uh, the northeast button does not activate the crosswalk. It stays with the orange hand. Small thing. But uh, those vehicles turning left from either direction tend to look at that crosswalk signal instead of people. Uh, I've also contacted the uh, engineering division. And um, also, since it, I thought it was a matter of public safety, I uh, called the uh, uh, police as well, non-emergency line. Although I hope it doesn't ever become an emergency call. So thanks. Thank you, Mr. Truscott. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. We'll certainly um, 
get back to you on that. Did you leave, sir, did you leave your contact information with engineering? They have your email and telephone number? Um, they, they probably do, but I can... I, I yeah, ping it, ping it back to us. We want to make sure we follow up with you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, yes, sir, in the back. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jay Rasberg. I'm from uh, the local 80 union. Um, I've been living in Royal Oak for about three years now. Me and my uh, girlfriend moved there uh, on uh, 203 Royal Avenue. Um, we really love your city. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just a little nervous, but... Um, it's my first time doing this. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, Mr. Rasberg. Uh, really like your city, and I would just, we would, uh, I would appreciate if we could get uh, more work, and uh, being a union member, we could get more work uh, in your city. Um, Yes, I, I, like I said, I've been in the union. I've been in the union for about a year. Um, What's your trade? Uh, sheet metal. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rasper. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sir? Yes, sir. Uh, 4046 West 13 Mile. My family moved to Royal Oak in 1970. Uh, Northwest section used to be called Beverly Hills Improvement Association. Mm -hmm. Those signs are gone now, huh? Uh, the early 80s on a change of custody, I took my daughter and enrolled her at this address I just mentioned, Parker Elementary. That too is gone. Uh, a later, well, through latchkey programs in Royal Oak, was able to stay there. Uh, early 80s, my another daughter came to live with me, enrolled her in Parker. They both graduated Kimball High. Uh, I'm a retired dues-paying member of Local 80. I worked sheet metal out 30 some years. Today, I, I shop Royal Oak. All my union buddies I talk to, the younger ones that live in this vicinity, we shop Royal Oak. We like Hollywood Market, Holiday, and Meyer. Uh, I've always been glad how you, you give a nod to the union help. You know what you're getting. Getting well-paid, trained employees to do the work. I heard mention about the apartment complex on Main Street. Uh, a lot of my product went into the other places. I remember those. So I just stress uh, the money I make, spent, I spend it here in Royal Oak. And again, uh, the other tradesmen I know that live here, we support the city. Appreciate you supporting us back. You can have the extra minute. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Huey. All right. Anybody else wish to speak tonight? Yes, sir. Fast draw on the back. Whoa. Oops. You just tell everyone it was your halo that put out the lights. Right? Uh, Patrick Sullivan, 1322 McLean. Living in Royal Oak since 1988. Um, a retired plumber. 42-year uh, member. Uh, because of the local, I've been able to earn a living wage, and even at retirement age, I'm still able to live here. I've remodeled my home, and I want to give a shout out to my commissioners that are using union labor and making it the city it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Daniel Stoika. 327 Marlin. 
I'm a retired sheet metal worker also. I've lived here since 1949, I think. <laughs> so I uh, appreciate all of Royal Oak. I've seen a lot of change here and seems like for the better. And I also appreciate the fact that we recognize organized labor in this city. <clears throat> and I know some people seem to think that cheaper is better and end result is maybe organized labor might look like it costs more at the beginning but when you consider the fact that statistics show organized labor has less accidents on jobs we have a better success rate of completion on time and fewer work stoppages which, which in essence will cause higher expense when you don't have that so cheaper may sound better at the beginning but in the end result maybe it's not so i appreciate consideration for organized labor thank you mr stoika thank you for st sticking around and making your point Kurt, sir. oh yes sir <clears throat> I'm Alex Williams with Mitchum Chapel AME Church, 4207 West 14. Um, I don't often have a whole lot to say, and I'll be fairly brief. Um, just wanted to let everyone here know that um, March 3rd through May 5th, we're kicking off our, uh, our second annual um, Spread the Love campaign, where we collect peanut butter and jelly for Lighthouse of Oakland County, which is a shelter um, that, uh, that supports um, local families in need. Uh, in particular, since our, our pastor has been with us the last couple of years, he's been um, working really hard to uh, combat hunger in Oakland County. And, uh, and this, is, this is part of that initiative. Uh, peanut butter and jelly may not seem like a big deal, but, uh, but for children who come home and are by themselves after school, it's, uh, it's important that they have something that they don't have to cook when they're home and they're hungry. Uh, many of them get food subsidies or food provided to them at school, but when school is out or on the weekends, they still need to eat. And uh, many times in these situations, their parents are working uh, both during the week and on the weekend. So it becomes really important uh, that we're able to do that. And so that's one of the things that we support. Uh, again, May th uh, March 3rd through May 5th. Um, last year, we collected over 800 um, peanut butter and jelly containers. And uh, Lighthouse sent us a letter that said that's the most that they collected all year from any of their drives. And so uh, we're a really small church, but, but we really hope that we can, uh, we can expand. Uh, we've got a larger goal this year that's a little more aggressive. So um, I really would, would encourage those um, on the commission and in the room and not watching on TV to, uh, to definitely help contribute to our campaign. And uh, we'll be doing a little more to, to reach out from our church and, um, and set up donation boxes where we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Anybody else wish to speak here tonight? Going once, going twice. All right, we're going to bring the meeting back up to this side of the table. That closes public comment. All right, that brings us to item number six, which is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? Commissioner Perouche. I'll move approval of the agenda. A motion by Commissioner Perouche. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Douglas. Discussion on the agenda? With none, uh, Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, Mr. Ashley brought up an issue with the safety of the parking in the Royal Oak Manor area. I would like to move that we add that to our agenda tonight. Okay, we have a motion on the table right now for the agenda. Are you moving to amend the agenda to amend the motion to include? That's this? correct. Okay, is there a second for that? I'll second that. Commissioner Gibbs, discussion? Commissioner Macy. Um, do we want staff a time to allow to respond to this and be prepared for it before we, what does, what, what purpose is discussion going to have today? What can, what's the action item? Well, well I suspect that what, what would come out of it is that we would ask staff to report back to us in future meetings. Commissioner Perush. I think staff has reported back to us three or four times, I think in the last couple of months, um, including a meeting that the chief of police had with 
uh, the administration at the manor and came up with a solution for the handicapped parking on, on 6th and, on, and Williams for additional handicapped parking there. I, I think my sense is that we're kind of at the bottom of the barrel in terms of solutions. Um, since we don't have a, a magic wand and can't create an independent parking lot for them for a private entity, my sense is that um, it, it, as much as we would like to be able to create parking for them, we have no resources to be able to do that, plus they're a private entity. In terms of the parking and the, the crossing issue, I think engineering is working on that. I think they are developing some signal improvements already across Main Street, so that's in process. So I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what else we would need to do tonight. So I'm not going to be voting for this. Yeah, I'll just add, we also, as it relates to the incident itself, um, you know, there's testimony here tonight at the podium about being hit and reporting uh, that information to the police department. And our chief slash uh, assistant city manager right now has committed to look into that. So I don't know what more we can talk about that. Um, and as Commissioner Proust said, we do have, I mean, if we want to have, any commissioner can get information from our engineering team to provide an update on what we're actually doing with the crosswalk with the um, with the changes that are planned. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I support putting this on the agenda at another time, but I just always feel it's a challenge to, um, you know, have staff um, answer to things without having any sort of uh, preparedness. Commissioner Macy? I just want to say that I, I, I agree with that, and I would be the third to put it on the agenda for the next time if what you're looking for is a report for the we report back on the situation rather than adding it tonight where we just have that be the case. Yeah, my, my concern is this is a long-term problem and I, I seem to remember a few months back we directed that uh, the DDA which is essentially our parking subcommittee to look at the situation and get back to us with recommendations and we we still haven't seen anything I want to make sure that this is in the forefront and getting the attention it deserves uh, because before too long uh, the parking lot that is across from Royal Manor is not going to be available and it's going to be a very imminent problem at that time. It's already a problem as far as a safety issue uh, for people who may not have the greatest mobility getting across the street. But I, I want to make sure that this doesn't simply not get the attention that it needs. Commissioner DeBuck. As previously stated, I think we've dedicated hours upon hours talking about this issue, and we have staff active on it right now. I think you know, we can nudge staff to bring back what's already been asked for from the DDA at an upcoming meeting, but by giving them time to prepare, by adding it to the agenda at the appropriate time. Uh, I don't think we need to keep browbeating this. It's, it's been brought forward a good number of times at this table. Any other discussion? All right, this is a vote for the amendment. Um, to the agenda and I think we all have agreement that if we give staff enough time we can I think you'll get alignment from everybody um, to bring this to this committee's attention just like we had the report from the police chief um, I think a couple meetings ago or last meeting but if there's more information that's requested we can afford professional staff the opportunity to respond to that in an organized way so I have no problem I just don't know that we add it to the agenda uh, until there's a thoughtful uh, process behind it. So, um, but anyways, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. Okay, this brings us back to the original motion for the agenda. Any discussion on that? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. We have an agenda. This brings us to the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to pull anything off the consent agenda this evening? <coughs> oh, Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of the consent agenda as presented. We have a motion by Commissioner Perush. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Dubuck. Any discussion? Okay, the consent agenda now consists of the City Commission meeting minutes from January 28th, 2019 and February 11th, 2019. Claims from February 15th and February 26th. Proclamation designating March Ethnic Heritage Cultural Month. Uh, 19th anniversary, building division request to fill vacancy, award of contract cap 1910-2019, water main improvements, Michigan Department of Transportation, local pavement warranty program, planning commission recommendation for conditional rezoning of 414 Oakland 
uh, second reading and receive and file the following non-action items the january 2019 southeastern oakland county resource recovery authority quarterly report the january 2019 southeastern oak county water authority quarterly report and local and major road status report update without any further discussion i'll call for the vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. those opposed motion passes all right, this brings us to item number eight, the award of contract trade work at the new police station. I see Mr. Fenton behind us. Mr. Fenton. Mr. Mayor, <coughs> City Commission. The resolution before you seeks to award eight trade packages for the construction of the new police station. Uh, seven of those recommendations are actually the lowest qualified bidder. We have one exception for uh, the elevator package. Uh, we're recommending Coney uh, in part because they are the preferred developer elevator vendor for the city. Um, together, these bids are about $32,000 under the budget that we had uh, established for the new police station. Um, as always, I have Chris Becker here to answer any specific questions you may have on, on these bids. Do we have any questions for Mr. Fenton or Mr. Becker? Commissioner Perush. I have a question about the electrical package. That's the only one that came in, not above budget, but uh, above a little bit kind of what we anticipated. Do you have any understanding as to why that one kind of is an outlier and why it came in that way? It, and it, it was all the bids. It wasn't just one that was out there. Do you have any any sense as to why it came in so weird that way, so high? It's really hard to pinpoint any given bid category and why it may come in or come over or come under budget. That's why we kind of try to look at them as a whole. Uh, but the police station has a very detailed scope of work electrically and uh, back when we were doing estimates it was before we had all the final documents okay. so i do believe that some of it had to do with the completion of the documents and electrical and the systems within the police station are very detailed uh, electrically so i i really believe that's the case um, I, I do want to get back to is we had a lot of bidders in most of the categories, which was really excellent turnout for the city of Royal Oak. I hope I answered your question. Yes, it's, you did. It's hard to pinpoint exactly. Yeah. Okay. That was that answers it. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioner Macy? Uh, we've heard a lot from uh, some union tradespeople today at public comment. Can you tell me what the status is union-wise in terms of these bids? Yeah, all, all eight of these um, recommended contracts are union contractors. Um, so we not only do we have good representation across the board, we had good union participation. Thank you. So they're all union contractors. Commissioner Lavasser. I, I have a concern with regard to the uh, concrete recommendations. I note that uh, our uh, contract manager is a partnership that involves Colasanti, <clears throat> but the recommendation is to give it the subcontract on concrete to a Colasante affiliate, uh, which would seem to, to violate the uh, uh, the contract we have with Colasante as a construction manager. Uh, I'm also noting that it is not the lowest bid. It's about $300,000 higher than the lowest bid. Uh, and, and granted, that particular bid indicated that, oops, we uh, didn't realize you wanted prevailing wage, but we're willing to give it to you but I don't see to see it, that there's been any exploration. It, it's such a so significantly lower bid than what Colasante made. I'm, I'm just wondering what what research may have been done to see if, if there's potential savings for the taxpayers here in the city. I appreciate the question, uh, Randy, very much. Um, the low bidder uh, concrete placement um, also, uh, they bid the job we looked at their bid. They actually, in their bid, said they had union labor, which is, you know, what what we look for. But uh, they were three hundred thousand dollars low. And when they got back to their office, they contacted uh, Colasani O'Brien and noted that they made a mistake on their bid. And they said that they didn't have labor union labor included. Um, and being that much lower, um, they, you know, would prefer to have union labor and they were going to give us a number to add. Um, but that added number was going to 
be a significant number, it probably would have still left them low, but isn't that convenient to go and take a bid, know where you stand in the bid market, and then come back and want to add to your number. It's a little on the unethical side. Um, it, it's not practical, so they really pulled their bid um, because they didn't have the, you know, what they thought was the right labor number. Um, and I believe that's the right way to go. Um, and with Colasani, there's a, there's a couple of things going on. If you go and look at that package and you look at the next bidder, which is El Benelli, a very good contractor, um, but when we look at our budgets, they were also at about one point, they're over $1.5 million, and our budget was just under $1.5 million. So they were actually over budget. And Colasani's number was um, almost $200,000 under the budget we had for that line item. Um, the real shame of it is, is that concrete placement didn't honor their bid number. Um, because um, with union labor, and we've dealt with them before um, in Royal Oak, um, with the union labor, they would have been a fine contractor. But to pull the maneuver that they did is just different. When you know you're $300,000 low and then you want to add, let's say, $275,000 to your number, that's not right. Okay. Uh, what? One of the things that, that I requested ahead of this meeting was what type of notice was given to prospective bidders as far as prevailing wage. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I have yet to see what, what notice went out, what, what specifications went out. Uh, so I, I can't really comment on, on whether or not they had notice that that's what, uh, what we were seeking here. But, but you know, let, me, let me ask this because it's a very significant number. It's like 30% lower than, than the others. Is that, is that typical, the difference between prevailing wage and non-prevailing wage? No, it, it's not. I would say 5 to 10% really would be max, or that, that's what we would see in the marketplace. 30% tells me something completely different. Um, and the fact that the bidder wanted to come back and change his number right away once he knows he's low, um, it's just not something that um, we do in the marketplace. It's not right. Okay, so if we added 10% to their number, they would still be $200,000 lower than Colasanti, which has a conflict of interest here. I, uh, and, and I just want to go into the conflict of interest just a little bit, um, if you don't mind. Um, when we went out for the CM bid packages, um, there was questions asked early on, would, would you allow self-perform work? Because a couple of the CMs that we were bidding with do self-perform work, including Clark, um, Colasani, um, they do self-perform work. So we said we would, we would be okay with it. Um, there's a couple of stipulations on self-perform work. And, and one thing is Colasani O'Brien, a joint venture that has the the CM work for Police Station City Hall and the connectivity. So it's not just Colasani, it's really an entity of a joint venture. Um, and they manage the job completely separate from the Colasani Construction Group. Colasani Construction Group does, um, they're doing the parking deck for us. They, they do do uh, self perform concrete work and probably a couple other trades, but that's the main thing that they look at. Where it comes a little bit different is the fact that in the contract, it does allow um, to take a look if, if the bidders are over budget, whether the CM could have some self-perform. But I really want to get back to Colasani is completely different and separate from Colasani O'Brien. Um, are they a part of the Colasani O'Brien? Yes, they are but they are not the same entity, and Colasani O'Brien manages the project separately. You're familiar with the, the standard contract, standard form contract that's used to? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a provision in there that basically says, as a construction manager, uh, you're not to subcontract out to entities in which you have an interest in. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, granted, they may be distinct entities, 
but there's a commonality there that would create a financial benefit toward uh, to, to, to Colasante as the construction manager. So, so that's that's the problem I have. Even you, even if they're distinct entities, it seems like there's a certain bias toward Colasante here that, that's that's specifically prohibited by the form. I. I I, I'm, I, I kind of understand what you're saying, but I don't believe there's a bias. I think it is um, a competitive nature. Colasani gave us a good competitive bid. We had hoped that the low bidder would honor their bid, like most of the bid packages did. And in this case, unfortunately, the low bidder didn't honor his bid and even tried to say that he had non-union labor in it when his bid said he had union labor in it. So we then go to the next bidder, which is Colasani, and within the contract there is some stipulations where we could use them, in, particularly in the case where the next bidders are over budget. And that's why we believe it's fair and uh, um, reasonable to recommend Colasani to do the concrete work on the police station. What if we were to recommend that we go back to that um low bidder and say, okay, we'll give you an extra 10% to cover prevailing wages, union late wages. Will you do the contract at that number? It's still $200,000 savings for the taxpayers. It's a negotiation, but I really want to go back to someone not honoring their bid. I think that we're, you know, the, the contractors out here honor their bid and that's the way we want to go. If the commission wants us to go back and have that discussion, we would have it. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. I, I, if that's what you would like us to do, we would do that. Um, we looked at the whole, the overall situation, and felt that it was appropriate to, and and, and again, fair and reasonable to go with Colasani um, on this situation because they are honoring their bid. But I'll do what you guys want me to do. Commissioner Perush. Um, first of all, I think we have to be very, very careful to, to ass not assume that just because the names are the same, that the entities are not separate and distinct. And in, in business law, when you have two separate and distinct entities, they can have the same names. <laughs> but they can operate separately and independently, and they each, as corporations, have individual rights to be able to bid on contracts and to operate in the marketplace independently of another company that might sound like the same company. And that's what our contract manager is telling us, is that you've got two separate and distinct entities here. They don't share any kind of, uh, one is not like a sub company of another company, they are separate and distinct. And as, as because of that, they have a right to bid on projects separately and distinctly as independent entities in the corporate world. And so we have to be really careful not to assume and to make the assumption that, oh, they must have the same name, therefore it must be a conflict of interest. That's highly irresponsible to make that kind of assumption or to assume that that's, you know, they're playing fast and loose, loose with the rules. Secondly, you've got a contract, an overall contract, that allows this type of activity to occur when the situation happens. When you've got a situation where everyone else is a bit above the budgeted price for the work, and you have a situation where um, you've got um, someone in a situation like this where they do come in under budget, um, and meet all the other contract specifications in the contract, that's what you need to go with. And the idea of going back now and negotiating after the bid package has come in with the alleged low bidder who did not do the original bid properly, I, I can't imagine that we want to start going down that road. If we were to start going down that road, we would lose all credibility as a, as a bidding entity in the contract world. Oh, it doesn't make any difference that what bid I submit. If somebody gets sloppy and submits a bid that is, that is bargain basement, and there's a possibility that they're going to go back with them and negotiate a contract, why on earth would I bid on the contract? We would lose all reputable bidders in the world. Nobody would want to put up with that. So the idea of going back and renegotiating Negotiating with a contractor that clearly put in a, in a bid that had errors in it, uh, knowing that this was a union contract bid to begin with, 
um, whether they missed it intentionally or whether they just missed it, I'm not sure. But the, the, the whole notion of going back and negotiating with them now just to save $200,000 for the taxpayers, to me, it, number one, it, there's no guarantee it would save a thing. And number two, it, 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 would, it would completely destroy our ability to get good contractors going forward because all the other contractors would say, <laughs> why would I possibly bid on this if this is what they're going to do with, some, with a bidder that comes in like this? So I, the, whole, the whole concept of, of going with them is just, I, I, it's incredible. Yeah, I think Commissioner Pirsch makes excellent points. Um, you know, whether or not they were formed, we had 119 firms respond to us that didn't seem to have an issue with uh, understanding our um, uh, demands as far as prevailing wage. As it relates to a conflict, it's self-evident for the fact that, you know, Colasanti was actually not the lowest bidder uh, in this independent process. So they only happened to become the independent or the lowest bidder once by default the other firm had to withdraw their bid because they couldn't honor it. And I think that sets a dangerous precedent. I mean, I spent years in automotive purchasing and I 100% agree with Commissioner Perouche. When you have a set of rules and you want good quality contractors to bid on those rules, you can't change the rules. Not only is there an integrity issue there, but there's also, you know, for, you have to not just think about this bid, you have to think about the next bid. And um, having that integrity matters. And I think um, if you can't get the bid right in the first place, what makes me believe that you're going to be able to complete the job right in the first place? So, um, you know, I think she makes very good points uh, that we need to listen to carefully. Um, I think I had Commissioner Macy hasn't had a chance to speak. <clears throat> yeah, and I just wanted to state that I think the idea that we're going to save $200,000 uh, is conflating several numbers that we heard from our consultant. One of the numbers was that there's about a 5 to 10% difference in a responsible bid uh, that is non-prevailing wage and a responsible bid that is prevailing wage. And Commissioner Lavasser is assuming that the concrete placement, given the opportunity to increase by only 5 or 10%, would then be able to do prevailing wage. But in fact, they already have been have basically done the math themselves. They went back with this bid and said, oh no, you wanted prevailing wage our mistake and added two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars to this. So they've already basically stated that the prevailing wage is what the Colasanti construction bid came in at, and it would not in fact be five or ten percent more. Commissioner Lavasser. Okay, are, are you familiar with who the principals are of Colasanti construction that does the subcontractor here? Yes. All right. Is there an overlap with the uh, construction manager? I think what you're. I think what you're asking me. I want to make sure I got this right. Is that the principals at Colasani, which president is Pat Wysocki, and that's the main guy we dealt with in getting the CM contract for like the parking deck. Is he part of the the joint venture? I'm sure he is. Okay, and what I'm looking at, I'm looking at the contract that we have for the construction manager, and specifically, just for the record, it's subparagraph 2.3.2.1.2. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of numbers. <laughs> uh, and it specifically says the subcontractor, uh, a, 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 a principal of, of the construction manager can't have more than a 10% interest in a subcontractor. And there's a few exceptions here, but those don't seem to, to fit here. So, so the, the, the question is, is there something that's happened that would allow for us or provide that a reason why we should uh, disregard the contract that, that's designed specifically to eliminate uh, conflicts of interest between the construction manager and, and the bids? Yeah. Mr. I, Becker, I'm gonna let our city attorney weigh on this because okay. I think that's an unfair legal question to put okay. you in position to answer. Commissioner, this is an issue that Commissioner Lavasser brought to my attention about 4.30 this afternoon. So I did have a chance to talk to Mr. Fenton. I did have a chance to talk to Mr. Becker before the meeting. And uh, collectively, we pieced together as much information as we could, but given the time constraints. So um, specifically, the, the, the section, the 2.3.2.1.2 that Commissioner Lavasser has made reference to. Um, first of all, the, the conversation I had with Mr. Becker um, just, I guess, for, for, for sake of moving the analysis along, um, he and I were assuming that for purposes of this section, that Colasani O'Brien and Colasani Construction did have the overlap, although we don't know that for sure. But again, just for purposes of the analysis, we were, we were assuming that they did. 
And if you take a, a further look at the rest of the that particular section, um, what it says that even if that's the case, even if there is the, the, the this overlap and and Colasani Construction shouldn't have submitted a bid, even if we're going to make that assumption. Um, if the low bid for the package exceeds the budget line item price for the package, and if we're excluding concrete placement as a non-conforming bid, then every other bid does exceed the line item price for the construction work, which is roughly $1.5 million. Um, the lowest bid above that from Albanelli that Mr. Becker made reference to is approximately $1.575. Um, so all the bids, other than concrete placement, which is non-conforming, and Colasani exceeded the line item price. If that's the case, then there are four procedures that the city can follow per the contract. First is to have <coughs> Colasani O'Brien negotiate with the low bidder, at this point Albanelli Concrete, to reduce the price of the bid package to a cost which will not exceed the budget line item price. That is to get Albanelli to back off their 1.575 number to roughly 1.5. Um, so that's option number one. Or reject all the bids, rebid the process again. Talking with Mr. Becker, we felt he feels pretty comfortable that if we do that, all the bids are going to come back in higher because everyone is going to know what the playing field is at this point in time. The third would be to award the contract to the low bidder, that is Albanelli, for a price above the budget line item, that is above the 1.499, which again would cost the city money, or the construction manor, manager, Colasoni O'Brien, shall perform the work himself for the amount of the budget line item price, the 1.499, or his actual cost, if lower than the budget price. Well, the bid they submitted is 1.311. So I think, again, there are four options that are set forth in the contract. And the fourth option, I think, brings us back to Colasani construction anyway, if we're assuming that, in fact, there is a conflict in the first place. And again, that's an assumption. That's a conservative assumption. Correct. So to hear you saying there's four options, and all of them would result in a higher cost to perform this work, with the exception of one that is provided to us as an option in the construction agreement, even under the most broadly broad assumption that there is overlap. Um, so doing anything otherwise in this particular case would increase the cost for the city of Royal Oak. Seems pretty simple and understandable to me. I mean, I suppose the fifth option is if you wanted us to, we could, would be to hold the, the issue over, at least this particular item in the contract or this particular if there's award, a reason. And then we can look into the conflict interest. But again, um, even You've if, already if assumed you're that assuming in your that there is a conflict, arguably it, it, it brings you full circle back to, if you want, call a sign of construction again for the lowest price. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Any other questions? Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of all of these bids. A motion by Commissioner Perush. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Dubot. Discussion? Commissioner Lavasser. I'll just simply say that uh, uh, I, I could support seven of these. I can't support the concrete one because of the issues that I just raised. So I'll be voting against the, the, the proposal. Any other discussion points? I'll be supporting um, this motion for a number of different reasons. One, all of these contractors utilize high quality skilled labor from the trades. Um, I think it's uh, pretty well known, the statistics show when we use good tradesmen, we get great quality product and that's what we committed for our residents here in Royal Oak. So number one, overarching, we have quality contractors here that use quality labor to get the job done on time. 
secondly, um, I think there were some interesting questions posed about the contract. I feel satisfied in the analysis provided by our city attorney, and I wouldn't want to risk increasing the cost of this project. Uh, uh, and so, therefore, um, I'll be supporting the recommendation by professional staff, uh, both in terms of decades of legal and decades of construction experience. Um, and so uh, I'm excited. We're going to break ground here in the police department, the new police department. This is pretty exciting. I know the chief is eager to get this underway. Um, I know he's already picking out uh, floral wallpaper for his office, but um, you know we might have to advise him on that uh, to some extent. So. Um, without any further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Can I have, uh, show the hand of the nays? Okay. Motion passes. 6-1. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to... Item number nine, the approval of the January 2019 Traffic Committee resolutions. Mr. Callahan, before we start real quick, um, I, just in case um, um, some people are still listening in at home, we had some discussion about the um, traffic signal uh, near Royal Oak Manor. Um, my understanding is that we are moving forward with plans to have a light and pedestrian island there. Is that correct? Uh, the pedestrian island, yes. Uh, the light is going to be relocated from what we salvaged from 11 Mile Road. It's going to be the push button pedestrian activated flashing lights. We're looking into ways to um, how that works on a boulevard type situation if you need to have one in the middle of the road. But it's in design for right now and it's um, you'll see it in as one of those CIP items for, for this year's budget. Um, for upcoming budgets. That takes so, a little analysis and a little work on the engineering side to get it done. It takes some time to, to design, up. some research. I mean, we're just finishing up with our construction projects for this that are going to start this spring and we're working on the summer ones. So there's uh, a design element, uh, the bidding out element, um, and we want to do it right. We don't want to do it wrong. Don't so. want to create harm on accident. Okay, thank so, you, Mr. Callahan. So, I just thought I'd take that opportunity. So, Mr. Godek, welcome. Right. Another citizen volunteer. <laughs> taking his good time to you know lead the traffic committee and listen to all of the great ideas that we have to improve traffic flow and pedestrian flow in this city so i don't know mr callahan or mr godek who wants to kick it off well i will start um, we met on the the 22nd of january um we had three items on the agenda the first item generated a second resolution so you'll see the first two resolutions were um, generated by traffic committee agenda item 5a the first one is to review stop signs on uh, woodsley um, which is uh, which we determined people are using as a cut through to get to from woodward to 13 mile road it's an easy route to take it's one of the few streets the one of the last streets just south of 13 that goes directly from woodward to 13. Um, um, while we didn't have a lot of high speeds and we had a low traffic numbers, the, the reason for the uh, no through traffic signs and the stop signs were uh, recommended to be denied. However, um, the second resolution regarding traffic backing up on Woodward due to the Starbucks is something that um, the traffic committee wanted us to get with the police department on and uh, try to find some solutions, get some uh, dialogue going with MDOT who have jurisdiction over um, Woodward Avenue. Um, the other items on the agenda were to review stop signs on Glenview and Glenwood where they tee into Oliver and that was recommended for approval and uh, we re-reviewed a situation on uh, North Washington at Crane where residents can't see out of their drives can't see as they pull out onto Washington due to parked cars and it's an area where the middle school is lots of traffic at different times of the day um, very difficult for them to get out of their dead-end street so we've come up with a solution to do some bump outs and we're gonna try to incorporate rain gardens with that and it should give them better sight distance to see getting out of that street Questions for Mr. Callahan or Mr. Godick? Commissioner Macy. So I drove, while dropping my middle schooler off today, I was driving past this, that, um, the crane in Washington, and I, I was trying to picture exactly where this is happening. Can you, can you draw me a picture of, <laughs> like, just with your hands? <laughs> so if I'm going south on uh, Washington. South of Catalpa. 
So the very first street on the right is Crane. Is Crane. Yep. It's a dead end street. I don't know. There's and there's parking right there. 12 houses on it, maybe. Nice home. 10 to 12 houses. Um, so those people are a little bit landlocked by their situation. They have only way, way to get in and out. So on, parking is allowed on that side of Washington and not on the opposite side. And as people come out towards that intersection, if there are cars parked to the north and south, you're trying to see past those cars to see the oncoming traffic. And there's a little bit of a curve in the road as you get to Austin. Um, so it was the, the complaint from the residents, and we had more than one resident come mm -hmm. forward and speak about that, uh, was that they couldn't see past the parked cars. Mm -hmm. They felt unsafe. Um, pulling out of their street to get either across and continue east on Crane or to turn right or to turn left. Um, in a moment of clarity, during the traffic committee meeting, we came up with some ideas that we took back to staff and re-reviewed, and, and we think this is a good solution. It's, it's a costly solution, but it's not the first costly solution with that the uh, traffic committee's ever proposed before. And it's something that you'll also see in the CIP for this year if it gets approved. Okay. So, I, I mean, I noticed, I, I know, and I'm sure, I'm sure Commissioner Douglas knows that it gets to be a little bit of a dangerous area. And um, I think this is a great idea, and it's a little bit costly, but it creates some more safety for our kids going to and from school and for the residents who live around there. Um, and I do see that one of those residents is here again tonight. Um, I'm, I'm all for it. Okay. Commissioner Douglas. Just a couple things. Uh, just a, a kudos to the staff for their innovation on the fly, really recognizing the, the, the potential here to solve a problem. Nice thing is we get water backing up on the on Washington during rain, and so some rain gardens or bioswales may help ameliorate that problem. Um, we also had a gentleman whose house is north of Crane on Washington who said he usually parked close to Crane so that he wasn't blocking his neighbor's you know driveways, even though he lives further north. And he said he would just stop parking there and would start parking further north to clear up the, the sight vision. It was just a really nice gesture. Um, from a neighborly neighbor. It's his wife here today. Oh. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Mr. Callahan or Mr. Godick? Anything to add, Mr. Godick? Uh, yeah, I covered it real well. Um, all these resolutions are in line <coughs> with the uh, staff traffic committee. I think uh, they're all good. Good. Good work. Commissioner Lavasser. I'll move that we adopt the resolutions. A motion by Commissioner Lavasser. Is there a second? Second, Ooh, second by Commissioner Perouche. Discussion. All right. Good work, guys. With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Have a good evening. You too, Mr. Godick. Thanks, Dan. All right. That brings us to item number 10, which is the Prohibition of Marijuana Establishments Ordinance, second reading. Mayor and City Commissioners, this is a second reading on a proposed ordinance that would prohibit adult use medical marijuana, adult use marijuana establishments <clears throat> as defined under the Michigan Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act, or MRTMA, as we are learning to love to call it, um, <laughs> through July 1st of next year, 2020. Um, we would recommend approval and adoption of the ordinance on second reading. Okay, just for everyone's clarity, um, you know, again, this is a temporary prohibition. It opens up an opportunity or the necessity for a future city commission, this city commission, to act in the event that no action is taken. So we have a discussion. The whole predication behind this deals with the fact that the state is going to need to get their rules aligned and we have to understand how that's going to impact us. In parallel, we are having an educational session uh, put on by Ms. Davids, Ms. Schwanger. Uh, they're putting it together to um, help inform this body uh, from different perspectives on the topic, a lot dealing with land use, those sort of issues. Um, clearly the voters have spoken. We just want to make sure we um, execute uh, the will of the voters. Um, we've done sunset clauses before on millages and all of these things because we believe that, you know, not everything should be permanent and should take that opportunity to look at things and, and, and force action. So uh, this is no different. It's not unprecedented. Commissioner Dubuck. 
Uh, agreed. I th I, you know, when we first uh, visited this issue and uh, staff was given direction to prepare this, uh, I voted against it. I thought that the timing was ill-advised. Uh, I respect staff's concerns. Um, I'm a little more comfortable now that we are moving in the right direction of getting a policy on the books and that this is not about uh, in any way subverting the will of seven, nearly 70 percent of our voters. So uh, the only thing that's given me a little bit of heartburn still is um, the date, uh, July 1st, 2020, still puts this out, um, you know, a year and a half from now. And that seems excessive given that we're, we're kicking off our communications program now. And I do think that such an overwhelming majority of people saying, yes, we want to see a policy enacted in Royal Oak, demands a little bit of urgency, which I feel like we're moving with. So um, but I'd like to recommend, and, and again, there will be an election in November. There could be a different commission sitting here. We want to make sure that this is on their radar, that they feel accountable to those voters that voted last November uh, to the tune of 70 percent, and that this gets addressed. So I, I would like to. To, uh, move to amend this that this uh, prohibition expires on February 1 of 2020 Commission at that time can change it if they still need more need more time I just want to make sure that we all have the sense of urgency that this demands and we're not sitting on our hands waiting for the state to come through because we saw with the medical issue that um, they had a hard, they had a hard time getting their their stuff together and I want to make sure that we know exactly what we want to do in spite of whatever might be happening with uh, regulatory uh, decisions at the state level. So that is a motion to amend this to read uh, sunsets on February 1st. A motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Macy. Further discussion, Commissioner Dubuck? I think it may be the case, and I think it's reasonable because, again, if more time is needed, that commission can act at that time. But that commission will have to make sure that the residents are aware. All right, we're kicking this just six more months or three more months because we need time to do X. Right. I don't want to allot all that time when we don't really know that it's needed at this point when the commission can act at any time to extend the sunset. Uh, I, oh, I'm going to go with Mr. Gillen before we have further comment. <clears throat> I don't want to interrupt the debate, but just one comment. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Jack DeBuck, just so you understand, with the July 1st, 2020 date on it, if the commission wanted to bring the ordinance back sooner it always could understood so i just i want to make sure that they're acting with a sense of urgency and you know an issue like this regardless of that overwhelming vote you know we'll have people on different sides of the issue and it's easy to not act when <laughs> when you don't want to have to make a decision when some people are going to be mad no matter what you do so i want to make sure the commission feels compelled to act. Uh, Commissioner Levasseur. Yeah, Mr. Gill made uh, a, a good point, one that, I, that had occurred to me. Uh, we, the commission, the, the next commission, uh, certainly has the ability to uh, uh, address this issue sooner than July 1st of, of next year. Uh, but considering that we very likely won't have feedback from the state of Michigan until late this year, we're really cutting ourselves short if we are changing the date to February 1st. Uh, I, I don't see a compelling reason to, to change the date which that's being recommended to us by staff here. Commissioner Douglas? I think, I think it's up to us as commissioners um, who are keenly interested in seeing this process move faster rather than slower, and that would be me, that is wanting it to move faster, adding my voice to Commissioner DeBucks. I think Commissioner Macy may have been in that place as well. Um, I I'm, I'm, absolutely intend to hold the staff's feet to the fire. I'd like to get this resolved in 2019. Commissioner Pruch. I would like to get it resolved in 2019 as well, just because it's one of those issues that the longer it lingers, the the less we get done. I mean, it just you know gets delayed and delayed and delayed. The discouraging thing, though, is I think I read in the paper today or online somewhere that the state of Michigan and whichever department it is that is working on establishing the rules, it might be. Lara, I'm not sure which one it is. Anyway, they just now are starting what they view as a, an enormous and very complicated public comment period where they just want to hear from everyone as to what you think about this and how should we develop this and what should we be doing as a state. And if they are just doing that now and their, their public comment period is going to be realistically probably like 60 days, what does that mean for their rulemaking process? I mean, that, that's going to push them. I, I don't know what it's going to mean for their rulemaking process, but it's nothing, it's nothing good. So it, um, it, I think we have to be prepared to push this forward on our own and not be reliant on what the state is going to be doing. Um, but on the other hand, I really agree with the fact that because most of us just want to get this over with one way or another, 
um, we will hold the staff um, and the community in check so that we can get this done sooner rather than later. I don't think we need to push out the date because I, I, I agree with Commissioner Douglas. I'd like to get this done this year if we can, just so that it's over with um, and, and decided and then, then we can move on to something else. Actually, there is a lot of wisdom in that, Commissioner Perush, because, you know, when you have something that's 70, 30, 70% 70 of the people did approve in our community, almost 70% uh, recreational use, you're still going to have around 30% that, that are against it. And you're still going to have a continuum as it relates to everybody's opinion on every other issue that associates with this. So this is one of the things that if you wanted to drag it on for 10 years, you could drag it on for 10 years. But at some point, we have to make sure that you know, we move forward with some plan, whatever that may be, so staff can work on everything else that is a priority in this community. Um, this is one of these things mandated by the voters. It came down through some regulatory uh, actions or will from the state, um, but we'll, we'll have to get it done. We'll have to get it done right. And then from there, um, you know, we need to spend our time making sure and keeping Royal Oak one of the safest communities uh, in the country and, and keep uh, the progress that we've been making as a community. And those are the things that we need to have staff and, and commissioners uh, spend their time on. So I think there is a risk of dragging it on. I think we need to hold ourselves to account to make sure we, I won't say quickly resolve it for the sake of quickness, but resolve it appropriately and uh, rightfully and um, with good thought and effort put into it uh, so we can move on and, and tackle other uh, objectives of this city. Commissioner Pruge. I have a procedural question for Mr. Gillum. If we change the date in this ordinance, does that mean that this has to be re-noticed and this has to come back to us again? <clears throat> no, you can make the modification tonight on second reading. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, any other discussion? Commissioner Macy. So I support moving this up basically because I agree with everyone that we should be getting this done in 2019 and we should have our feet to the fire, uh, which is why I won't be supporting the overall motion once again, because I think um, we're doing this 11 months in advance. As we talked about in the work session, there's no reason to pass this on second reading until we are much, much closer to a decision date. And doing so is just sending a message repeatedly re over and over again to the community that we didn't listen to them. Um, we have a work session coming up next week. So passing this ban immediately before there's a work session where we get any kind of input or any kind of uh, we even learn about this ourselves seems really premature and having passed it once it only takes another time bringing it in front of the Commission to pass it on the second reading and, and be done we could do that in November we could do that in December um, this uh, this whole thing seems to me to be premature so I will be supporting the amendment because I think the uh, the faster we move on this the better to get this settled for our community um, but I won't be supporting the emotion the um, the resolution itself well, I believe we only have a motion with a motion for the second reading with the change. So there's actually just no, I'm one. I'm for an amendment only. Move for an amendment only. Okay. All right. So there's an amendment on the table to modify the uh, ordinance to end in February. Is there further discussion? We'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Aye. Okay. So now the ordinance has been changed, the proposed ordinance. Commissioner Dubuck. I'll move for passage of the modified ordinance. We have a motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Yes. Second by Commissioner Perush. Further discussion? All right, with none, I'll call. Oh, Commissioner Macy. Remembered I wanted to respond to something that Commissioner Perush had said um, about the state and the task force in the comment period. And I read that a little bit differently in the news today. Um, this is a new administration, remember, that we have. And this is a new administration that came into office supporting uh, Proposition 1 for the most part. I have a feeling that they are motivated to work fast and to get this done, which may not have been the case when medical mar marijuana was passed. Um, so this is a... It's a new day. I'm really curious to see how they handle it. And I, ha I read it differently, like, oh, they're getting started. Good. <laughs> well, I, I hope you're right, because I, I mean, they need to get it done as well and move on to other things. Yes. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, no matter what side you are in this issue, resolution as far as what Royal Oak is going to do needs to happen as quickly and effectively as possible. I think we all agree on that. OK, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion passes. All right, I believe that brings us to the end of our agenda. Notwithstanding any other important business to advance the city of Royal Oak, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Douglas. 
<laughs> Commissioner Douglas, what is your motion? I move we adjourn. We have a motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? An enthusiastic second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion on this motion? I don't see any. So I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Adjourned.